One of the um, benefits of aging is that you, you become able to acquire um, more balanced perspectives. You know, when you're young, you kind of sometimes have limited uh, experience, and therefore you can jump to certain conclusions. But as you get older, your experiences tend to um, increase, and of course, experience is a great teacher. Uh, and normally, the older that you are, the more experiences that you have. For example, one of the things that I have learned from experiences as I got older is that you can't help people who don't want to be helped. I would often uh, persist stubbornly sometimes with people thinking that I was good enough to eventually make them see the light or, or accept my advice or my better judgment. When I finally figured out uh, that you can't help those who actually don't want to help themselves, it really became rather liberating. And so these days I am more careful about uh, who I in, uh, try to help and who I invest myself in, who I focus on. Um, and, um, and I certainly don't uh, focus anymore on people who are just blinded by their pride and actually don't want change to happen. And amazingly, you, you will get people going from church to church, sometimes always asking for prayer for a certain thing. But what they're really looking for is just for an easy solution to the problem. They're not willing to do what needs to be done for that change to take place. And most of God's promises, you will see that God says, I will do this if you do that. And so often in life, we are required to do certain things in order to make the promises of God come true in our life. And I mean, I'm all for taking a pill that deals with the issue, but I haven't found very good pills to do that. Now, as we see Paul's ministry developing and maturing, it seems that he too uh, was learning this lesson about who to invest himself into. Now, after leaving Corinth, uh, Paul revisits some of the towns that he had been ministering in, and, and he kind of does a loop ending back in Ephesus. Unlike the poor results that Paul seemed to have had in Athens, his ministry in Ephesus ended up being, you know, very successful. Now, of course, as usual, it wasn't clear sailing for Paul. Opposition soon flared up, and, and he was back in trouble again, even in Ephesus. Now, try or not, Paul seems to always be in the middle of the action. And, and for this reason, he always had a lot of confrontation. Nothing new in this regard for him in this city. Now, it seems that um, whenever Paul preached, there, there was always either a revival or a riot. <laughs> and, um, and we're going to see a, a bit later that this was also the case in Ephesus. Now, I guess like Paul, we too should expect reactions when we step out to preach or share the Word of God, because when the Word is preached, people ought to feel something. Don't you think? You know, uh, the Word has that impact on us. I mean, when people hear the Word, they're either going to be glad that they've heard it, or they're going to be sad, and many will even be mad about it. The bottom line is that if we share the Word of God, and it, and it, and, and, and it produces no reaction at all, then we must be using a fake Bible. Anyway, let's read what happens when Paul sets himself up in Ephesus. Acts 19, verses 8 to 10. Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Now, as usual, Paul starts in the local synagogue. Now, sometimes he would only last one sermon. Sometimes he might last a few. Um, but here we see that he was given the pulpit for a whole three months. Now, let's read on. Uh, verse 9. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Sounds like it's raining. As usual, Paul tried to persuade the Jews that their Messiah had 
already come. And as usual, the opposition came from the hardliners. You know, no one likes opposition. How many of you here like opposition? Okay, none of us like opposition. But you know what? Quite often when we're serving God, opposition simply becomes an opportunity to do what we need to do differently. In other words, we find another way to accomplish the will of God if we're getting opposition. And guess what? Sometimes that way ends up being better than the original way. And so it was with Paul. This opposition turned into a real turning point in his ministry. Ephesus was the capital of the Roman province of Asia, and it had a population of some 300,000 people at the time. Furthermore, it was a high traffic city for travelers, and it became a launch pad for spreading the gospel throughout the rest of Asia Minor. So Paul saw his work in Ephesus, uh, he saw that it was going to be a much bigger thing than what he could do out of the synagogue. Because guess who only went to the synagogue? Jews. And there was not 300,000 Jews in Ephesus. And so he saw his mission there much bigger than the synagogue. And so when the resistance flared up, he just walked away and he went looking for those who wanted to hear the truth. It seems Paul was either given the use of the lecture hall of Tyrannus or he was able to hire it. Um, and this is what's left of that building today. Maybe not. Can somebody go help me out with my clicker? Um, anyway, this hall was most likely a lecture room um, of a private school. Or oh, here it is. It's finally woken up. Um, and Paul would have probably been using it after school hours. Like most Greek cities at the time, Ephesus was a wealthy city, but a city of great wickedness and weak morals. It was a place of spiritual darkness. And Paul was about to bring them the glorious light of the gospel. Now, despite the spiritual oppression over the city, Paul saw this place of darkness as a place of opportunity. Because he had the opposite philosophy, philosophy to what so many Christians seem to have these days. You know, most Christians today, they don't want to be in a dark place. They look for the nearest exit, wanting only to be in spiritually well-lit areas. And I get it. It feels safer to be in the light. Most of us, uh, as we were kids, were afraid of the dark. Some of us still are. You know, I've often heard Christians say things like, you know, there's so many unbelievers where I work. I, I, I feel surrounded by darkness. I, I've got to get out of there. Please pray for another job for me. Now, you know, if we ever feel that way, we need to ask ourselves the question, you know, is this why God put me here? Because it is a dark place. You see, let's not forget that in Matthew <coughs> Excuse me, Matthew 5, chapter, uh, sorry, chapter 5, verse 4, God calls us, he calls Christians the light of the world. He's not saying the light of the church. <laughs> He's saying the light of the world. And he says that we should not hide our light under a basket. In other words, we're, we're meant to be seen shining. If you think of yourself as a light bulb, like one of these... Tell me, what would be the point of your existence if when you got turned on at the wall, you didn't light up the dark room? Now, one of these got turned on and it didn't light up. Didn't light up. What's the point of having it there? It's not doing what it should do. These other three are, but that one isn't. And so there would be no point in you being a light bulb if you didn't shine light. And Jesus has called us the light of the world. That tells me that we should be shining in the world. And we know that the world has darkness. Now, of course, we need to be wise and careful about some of the dark places because some of them will have the potential to drag us down uh, or overcome us with temptations. You know, I've known some young Christians who made the mistake of trying to reach their old friends who were still in darkness before they had built a strong foundation for their own faith. This is not usually a wise thing to do. 
But mature Christians who have built their faith on a solid foundation should not be concerned or afraid of the darkness in other people. Why? Because light always dispels darkness. Darkness cannot snuff out light. Have you noticed that? Truth is that the brighter the light, the more it dispels darkness. Likewise, the darker the room, the more our light will be seen and the more darkness it will disperse. In this room right now, none of us stands out as being so bright. And that's because we are amongst other lights. But in your workplace or your school or gym or wherever you might go, just by walking in, whether you know it or not, the light in you can change the atmosphere. Light always attracts people. It attracts bugs too, for some reason. <laughs> but light always attracts people. And some of them will want some of that light that they see in you for themselves. And so we need to keep a lookout for people that are looking for the light in us. We can't tell them apart if we look. Now, Paul in Ephesus was being a very bright light in that dark city. Not only that, God uh, was empowering him to do miracles that would have got the city talking um, and soon flocking to the whole of Tyrannus. One of the reasons that Jesus um, attracted huge crowds was because of the miracles that he did. God wanted to attract Ephesians to Paul. And so he empowered him to do miracles like they had never seen before. Let's read on Acts 19, verse 11 and 12. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. Wow. Wow. That's pretty cool stuff, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's worth trying. Or in my case, go in Jesus' name. You know, I have known a few ministers who have tried to duplicate the healing handkerchief miracles. Um, but you know what? I've only seen it work once. And funny enough, this particular hanky was given to me by a minister. And I was told to put it under my pillow. Not sure what it was meant to do, but I didn't notice any difference. Anyway, we need to uh, make note that verse 11 tells us that God gave Paul the power to do unusual miracles. Now, unusual means that they don't usually happen. Does that make sense? Yes. And so this, this prayer cloth thing that we sometimes hear about, uh, God considers an unusual miracle. Now having said that, I do remember hearing a handkerchief testimony when I was in T.B. Joshua's church in Nigeria in 2002. A businessman came in to testify. The church was full and he came in front of us all to testify um, uh, that, um, you know, a prayer cloth that... T.B. Joshua had given him work. Um, he had come to see T.B. Joshua for financial advice because he was going broke due to his clients not paying him their debts. He had a lot of clients owing him, and if he didn't get paid, he was going to go out of business. And uh, he then opened this big duffel bag full of cash, and he emptied it on the floor in front of all of us. Um, it looked like a stack of cash, you know, the sort of thing a drug dealer would carry around. I don't know. Apparently, it was 350,000 naira, which at the time was worth about 1,500 Australian dollars. Not a lot for us, but a lot for him. The difference between staying in business and going out of it. He then testified that T.B. Josh had given him a handkerchief and told him to go and put it in his office. The following day, his clients started coming in one after the other to pay their debts. And he said that it was a miracle because... You know, just the week before, he had rung them all and chased them all down, and nobody could pay. And yet, 
that week they all came in and they paid up their debts. And so he believed that it was because Joshua had prayed an anointing on uh, the handkerchief and told him to put it in his office. And he brought the money to show us all how much um, he had been paid, which was a very brave thing to do because Lagos was a very dangerous city and uh, carrying around that much cash was not wise. But anyway, he was wanting to give God the glory for saving his business. And so unusual miracles do happen, but unusual, unusual miracles mean that they don't usually happen. And that was certainly the only time that I um, had seen someone testify about how uh, a prayer cloth or uh, prayer hanky had worked for him. Verse 11 doesn't give us enough details for us to, you know, uh, form a doctrine on healing handkerchiefs or aprons. And so uh, we can only use our imagination about how it all started. I imagine that um, this uh, hall of Tyrannus did not have air conditioning. And so it would have got pretty hot in the afternoons when Paul was likely to be using it. These days, most speakers are, you know, given a bottle of water to sip on when they speak. And that's all you need in an air conditioning room that sometimes even feels like a fridge. But with Paul, he may have had uh, a handkerchief to, you know, wipe the sweat off his brow as he was teaching. And so maybe someone decided to go and change his handkerchief and give him a fresh one. And so the usher with a dodgy hip limped over to change it. And when he picked up Paul's sweaty hanky, he suddenly got healed. Now, I know you all have an imagination, so please work with me, all right? The usher can't believe what just happened. And so he starts jumping around all excited, and he goes over to his one-eyed wife, and he gives her the handkerchief so she could wash it, and suddenly she starts seeing from both eyes. Everyone's amazed. And so the usher um, puts the handkerchief up for auction and everyone starts bidding on it. And no, just kidding. Enough imagination. All right, let's come back. You know, if we look into the culture at the time, it's actually possible that God was actually mocking their false pagan religions with this type of miracle. You see, these pagans were well known for their emphasis on uh, clean white garments. In their rituals, they all had to wear prim and proper and sparkling white garments. And so perhaps God was saying something like, your pristine white garments are powerless, but I can do miracles using old sweat rags. You know, I'm just reading in between the lines here, of course, but I wonder if that was what it was about. I wonder if it was an unusual miracle for that time and place. In any case, the miracles, unusual or conventional, all help bring in the crowds. We see in verse 10 that during the two years that Paul spent teaching in this hall, he was able to reach all of the province of Asia. And this means that he reached some two million people. In just two years, every single person in Asia Minor heard the word. That's amazing. Now, of course, we can be sure that not all of them got saved, but at least all had the opportunity to accept the truth of the gospel. In one way or the other, Paul would say to everyone that he could to not be satisfied with empty religious rituals when they could have a thriving um, and vital relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In one way or another, he always got that message out. Now, of course, statements like this, while being the truth, are very aggravating for people who have devoted their lives to following the strict rules of their powerless religions. The gospel in itself is what irritated the Jewish leaders the most because it basically said all of your rituals and all of your paraphernalia is worthless because what Jesus did on the cross is what makes the difference. And so that was very offensive to them. The power that was demonstrated through, these, uh, through the handkerchiefs that Paul had handled were part of what God was using to establish the authority of the name of Jesus in that place. And so on the heels of the miracles caused by people touching Paul's handkerchiefs, we see some new characters show up in town. And it was not by chance that these fake copycats showed up 
in town at this time. Let's read on and read about them. Acts 19, verse 13 to 16. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? <laughs> then the man with the evil spirit leapt on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. Now sadly, you know, there have always been ministry imitators like these seven men. And I'm not saying that they all have bad intentions. Some of them might have good intentions. But even if you have good intentions, you can still be an imitator. These are people who are trying to imitate the calling and ministry of others when they don't have one themselves. These imitators existed in the early days of the church, and guess what? They still exist today. Many of them are great showmen. And so they're able to fool people who lack discernment. And of course, you know, when a Christian lacks discernment, it's because they don't study the Word of God for themselves. They just rely on what they listen to from others. Now, some years ago, someone decided to bless me by installing Christian satellite TV in our home. And this was before YouTube was, um, you know, had become a popular platform for church-related content. Uh, I was suddenly exposed to what was going on in Christian satellite TV. And frankly, some of it was amazing. I mean, it was great to watch some of the great preachers as if you were visiting their churches uh, all over the world. And that was pretty cool. However, mixed in with the good preachers were the fake ones, the imitators. The ones who were saying that for a price, called a donation, that you could get an anointed prayer cloth or uh, a little bottle of miracle oil prayed over it uh, by the guy on the screen. They would sometimes say things like, put your hand on the TV and feel the power. Or stare at me closely as I pray for you. Or, or as you send in your donation, visualize what, what you want from God and you will get it. And other nonsense like that. Unfortunately, some of these people have large followings, even though they're uh, imitators of real ministries. Sadly, this only shows us just how much a lack of discernment there is in the wider body of Christ. Now, of course, we do learn from our passage today that if you persist in, you know, in a fake ministry, that you might eventually get hurt. We only have the authority over demons when we are in Christ. This authority comes only from being in relationship with him and not just by using his name. Satan is not afraid of you or I on our own. But he does know that he can't touch us without God's permission. He also knows that God has given us the right to use the name of Jesus against him. And whenever you use the name of Jesus, it's, think of it this way. You are standing in the gap for Jesus. When you do something in Jesus' name, it's as if Jesus was there. You're taking place as an ambassador of Christ. And when you say to a demon, go in Jesus' name, it's as if Jesus is there saying that. And whenever he said that, what did demons do? They went. And so he knows that God has given us the right to use his name if we are indeed his. The seven sons of Sceva were not Christians. And they did not have the right to use the name of Jesus against devils. And that's why they're overpowered and, and beaten up by this demon-possessed man. You see, when you're filled with the Spirit of God, demons will know that they're not just dealing with you, but that they're also dealing with the Spirit of God in you. And that's why they'll always back off when we stand against them. That's why we should never be afraid of the darkness. If this attempted exorcism had succeeded, 
by people who are not Christians, it would have belittled the disciples of Jesus and diminished the uniqueness of his church. But instead, when people saw that the sons of a Jewish priest had no power compared to the Christian Paul, the news spread and Jesus was glorified. Let's read on, Acts 19, 17 to 20. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to Jews and to Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. And so the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. It seems from verse 18 and 19 that many of those who had become believers hadn't yet made the clean break with the world that God wants his children to make. And so after seeing or, or hearing about how one demon-possessed man was able to beat up seven men, they were done with that world. Some had been practicing witchcraft. And we see their repentance by the fact that they decided to burn their very expensive witchcraft libraries. You know, in today's terms, uh, you know, we would probably say that they still had uh, their Uji boards or their tarot cards or, or their Harry Potter books or, or uh, their video games and, uh, or, or their demonic um, DVD collections and so on. When people become Christians, they start a journey which should be characterized by repentance from many things. We don't get to deal with everything that we need to give up on the first day or first week. Sometimes it takes a while for us to realize what we must give up or discard from our lives. The first thing we do is invite God into our lives and then, guess what? The cleaning process starts. We were just talking about repentance at our foundations course on Thursday. You know, it's a vital topic and it's one that I think Christians need to revisit from time to time because, you know, as we live our lives out, we will often find new reasons and things to repent from. These new believers saw this demon attack on the counterfeit Christians and they were convicted that they still had unfinished spiritual business to take care of. When Jesus is magnified, sin gets exposed. Isaiah, by normal standards, was a godly man. But when he saw the King of Kings in his glory, he said, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, as we see in Isaiah 6, verse 5. Folks, God wants to change us. And with some of us, he needs more time. Or perhaps I should say, we need more time. With some of us, he may still be waiting for us to give up some of the old things for him. He may be waiting for us to replace them with some new things that are going to improve our life. In Acts 19, we see that there was a book-burning public bonfire. Have you had your own bonfire? Soon after I became a Christian, I led one of my father's tenants to the Lord. And a few days later, he came to me with a bunch of records and cassettes you know, back in the cassette tape days, before CDs. Anyway, he brought his hard rock music to me and he said, look, I just feel that I should get rid of these. What do you think? I mean, I had never talked to him about that. It was the Holy Spirit convicting him of what he needed to get away from. It was, it was awesome. You know, so often we jump on people telling them what they gotta do, what they don't have to do, and we just blow them away. Give God a chance to speak to them. It always works better when it's the Holy Spirit dealing with stuff in your life. Isn't that true? Amen. Has the Holy Spirit asked you to get rid of something, but you're still hanging on to it? Another thing that spoke to me last Thursday at the Foundations course was that if we neglect repentance when prompted or challenged by the Holy Spirit, then we break fellowship with God. There's always a consequence when God challenges about something and we say, well, no, I'm not going to deal with that. Thank you very much. I don't want to let that go yet. No, I still, I'm not done with that. 
Whenever we do that, to the Holy Spirit, we break fellowship with the Lord. The NLT says that the value of the books burned was several million dollars. Now, the exact amount listed in the other translations was 50,000 pieces of silver. And in those days, a silver coin was worth a day's wage. And that means that in today's money, based on the average Aussie wage, those books were worth about 11 to $12 million. Now, that was a lot to give up in any man's language. Because God has not finished working on us. It's possible that some of you may need to go home and, you know, maybe pour something out. Uh, maybe throw something out or flush something down. You know, some of you may need to get your home in order in some areas. Or get a handle on some things. And I'm sure that in some churches, some people may even need to get married and not just appear that they are. Jesus never said that it was going to be a free ride to follow him. In fact, he told us to count the prize. He said, make sure you know what you're doing if you're going to follow me. Something worth noting is that the demon speaking through that demon-possessed man said that they didn't know who the sons of Sceva were, but they knew who Paul was. Do the local demons know who you are? Are they threatened by your witness? Seriously, do they know you because you are a threat? Or do they not know you because you're no threat at all? I sure hope the local demons in this area at least know who Lifehouse Church is. I hope that we are indeed a threat to the darkness around us. I hope our Lifehouse family is seen as a shining light in this neighborhood and in the neighborhoods where we happen to live. If you've been following the news around the world, you'll have noticed that things are getting crazier by the day. Deception is rampant. Truth is being suppressed. And it is easy to get discouraged when it seems that darkness is getting darker and growing all around us. However, we need to remember that God knows how this all is going to end. He is still the creator of all whether people accept him as such or not. And while we may not always see what he's doing or see the immediate results of what we do for him, it doesn't mean that things don't happen. Let's take uh, what ended up happening in Ephesus, um, for example, after Peter left, you know, because the revival that took place there uh, caused many of the pagans to give up their idol worship to follow the Lord. Um, Jesus was, uh, sorry, um, Ephesus was very proud of, of, um, of their temple of Diana. She was the chief, um, you know, source of their worship, or object of their worship, I should say. And they were very proud of her. This... Um, of course, started costing the local manufacturers of statues a great deal of money. When people stopped worshiping Diana, they were no longer interested in buying uh, the statues or the trinkets that these guys were making. Um, and I won't read it now for the sake of time, but in Acts 19, verse 23 through the 41, we read about the commotion that these idol traders had started. A guy named Demetrius and his cohorts had been making a fortune selling statues of Diana, but of course sales were dropping fast. Now, of course, they weren't really worried about losing their religion. With them, it was more about losing money. They were worried about their sales. <laughs> Eventually, Paul had to leave the city because again, his life came under threat from these businessmen who were losing money because of his preaching. However, while Paul left the city, the gospel stayed behind and it continued to spread and eventually everyone lost interest in the temple of Diana. Now this is a model of what the temple used to look like. It was a pretty fancy building. And of course it wasn't the only one in the world. I found ruins of a temple of Diana in Evra, a city in Portugal of all places. I didn't know that Diana got there. 
And, um, and there's also one that's quite well preserved in the city of Merida in Spain. In fact, there are ruins of many other temples of Diana throughout the Middle East and Europe. But like all the others, the one in Ephesus didn't survive either. And today it looks something like this. The worship of Diana was the biggest religion in Ephesus. And her temple was considered one of the seven wonders of the world at that time. No one would have believed that the gospel would have brought down this dominant religion in Ephesus, but it did. The light of the gospel dispels the dark dispel the darkness in Ephesus, and you know what? It dispels uh, the darkness everywhere it is preached. Paul got them saved, and after that, they simply didn't need Diana anymore. Can I have the team up, please? Once a person gets saved and comes into a relationship with Jesus, they won't need anyone else either. Jesus not only brings us salvation from our sins and the promise of a glorious eternal life in the loving presence of God. But you know what? He helps us to live out this life in peace and well-being. He is our comforter, our provider. He's our healer. He's our light. And with Him in us, there will be no darkness in our life. Indeed, He is our everything. And God's people said, Amen, Amen indeed. And as we sing our closing song, if the Lord... Um, wants to minister to you this morning. If you have any needs, uh, then please come. Brittany and I would be glad to pray with you or see one of our prayer team and they can pray with you as well. Uh, just before we do that, let me just pray for all of us. Father God, we just thank you for, for your word, Lord, and how it enlightens us. Lord, your word says that itself is a light onto our path. It helps us find our way in life. And so we thank you for it. We thank you that it is so freely available to us. And Lord, I ask that you would give us a passion to read it, to consume it, Lord God, to learn it, to study it, to get to know it. Because it's easy, Lord, to let the weeks go by and suddenly it's Sunday again and we just rely on what we hear on a Sunday. But I believe we need more than just what we can hear on a Sunday. And so, Lord, give us a passion for your word, Lord God. Give us a desire to study it every day. And I ask this in your precious name, Lord Jesus, believing that I'm asking for something that's in accordance with your will. And so I ask it again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.